Hey you guys, EST here with another crucial video. This one's super, super important. And you know me in like the clickbait alarmist headlines, not really how I do things on this channel unless it merits it, but boy, is this a blind spot for people. And I don't know if I should even use the term blind spot, but um, people just, they overestimate their ability to deal with situations. That's kind of what's leading to this. The number one mistake that I think people make besides like actual blind spots, which I already have a series on, like everybody forgets windshield wipers, sunglasses, uh, what else is on there? I don't know, just go watch the videos. Yeah, you ain't going anywhere without sunglasses. But like from people who survived like pretty large scale stuff, war zones, weather events, you know, extended power outages, riots, you know, like just bad scenarios. What they said is, boy, I, I wish I had remembered this. I didn't realize I needed this. Didn't, didn't realize I didn't have that. Didn't realize that this didn't work either from skills or object standpoints. So that's why I did that series first. But now we're talking about the second thing you always hear from people who went through it, which is I thought I was mentally tough. I thought I was mentally prepared. And then it just, it, it was just one thing after another. And the worst thing and I have alluded to this in other videos is sitting there alone with your thoughts, worrying about a lack of communication, what your family's up to all that. When the process is going, it's a lot easier. I, I hate to say this, but well, I was the one there, so I'm going to do it. I was at a mass shooting. I kept it together because it was just nonstop. Look left, look right. You know, where are they? Where's the gunshots coming from? Should I be behind cover? What are these people doing? What are we being instructed to do and why? Can I get closer to this person to hear what's on their radio? You know, it's just go, 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 go. If you can switch it off and not just fall apart and panic, which I think, you know, preppers generally are more mentally prepared because they've kind of gone through things in their head or that's just their personality. 20 year old city people who have a meltdown if they can't have their Starbucks, you know, maybe not. Our personality in this community, we're already off to a good start, generally. But any human being, unless they are like a sociopath or have some kind of abnormal brain function, or I should say personality defect or whatever, I don't know, psychology. The second that you are out of your house with your bug out bag sitting in a temporary shelter with or without other people around you and, and, and just things are out of your control, people don't like to feel out of control. You can push through it. You can distract yourself. There's certain like methods to work through it, but everybody's gonna, you know, get closer to their breaking point or hit it when it's like, oh, I'm cold and I'm hungry and I'm worried and I can't contact my family and, 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 and. Everybody tells me from every, you know, talking about it after the fact scenario, I thought I was pretty tough, but it was just one thing after another and I had to worry about this and do this. Then it was lack of time. Then it was, you know, did I do this in the right order? But then I'm stressed and I, I find myself just stopping and thinking about like, what's my family doing? What about this? Did I grab the right documents? Do I have my insurance? When you're sitting there alone with your thoughts and everything's settled, like you made a fire, you got a little bit of food, you got your packing, you're all cozy. Well, now you get to sit there with your own thoughts. Wonderful. That'll go well. That is the toughest part. That's 50% of the reason that people say put like some kind of puzzle book or crossword or something in your emergency bug out bag because it's just something to do. Or like a battery bank to run your phone so that you can go familiarity. At least I can use my phone. I can listen to music. I can do you know, whatever. Not to mention GPS and opening, you know, survival PDFs on your phone. So what can you do about mental preparedness, about like situational, I'm going to keep it together? Well, believe it or not, it's having done something similar or exactly the same before, because then you can say, well, okay, I've done this and I know from experience that I can handle it. And that's just one of the purposes of this video. I think you're going to enjoy it quite a bit. So it's really just a list of things that you can try that will make you more prepared mentally and skill wise in the future. And about halfway through the video, I do explain like why this is going to help you from like a psychological standpoint. I think you're going to find it very interesting and very useful. So uh, please do watch the whole thing. So I wanted to make this series, and usually it wouldn't have this long of an intro, but I wanted to introduce it, because, duh, this is of course going to be a series, why would it not? Don't know what I'm going to call it, but it's basically like prepper challenges, like the, the try this first. And the whole theory is, well, let's fight psychology with psychology. Now, I'm not a psychologist, and also, huge disclaimer, I'm also not a doctor, so you really shouldn't do some of these things, or well, I'll just say all of it, without consulting a medical professional based on your individual needs and that kind of stuff, because, like, if I were to say, hey, let, let's let's try, see how your body reacts to not eating for a day that's your challenge if you're diabetic that can like kill you so not only am i not going to say do that but you'll see i'll mention it for the first couple ones like some things that could go wrong but just use your brain and don't do something just because i told you to check with an expert depending upon if you think it might affect you the wrong way you know etc just big old blanket this could be more dangerous than it seems on the surface uh disclaimer over all of this so like number one try changing the temperature in your house up or down like five degrees Fahrenheit. And then just try to like live that way for, for the day. 
Now, some of you might be out there saying, yeah, that, that just sounds like my house. Like, some of you don't have, like, central air. I don't. I mean, I got window units and stuff. And even in the winter, you walk into a different room, you got about a five-degree difference. But, like, you know, you can even try sleeping in it. See if your extra blanket works. See if you can improvise something. See if you can sleep in two layers of clothes or if you find that too distracting. Uh, I've noticed that depending upon the cut of the collar of my shirt, if it's a little too tight, where if I'm upright walking around, I don't feel it. I don't feel like I'm being strangled. It's not a turtleneck, but I noticed if I try to sleep in certain shirts, I cannot fall asleep because when I'm uh, laying on my side, I guess I have really broad shoulders or something. I don't know. Or who knows? Never would have known this was a problem, but I cannot fall asleep because I'll feel like my shirt's like strangling me. You know, it's just hitting on the wrong part of my neck. It's highly uncomfortable. I'm sure that's just me. I'm weird like that. But the shirt had to go. Now, a looser cut shirt, I was fine. So what did I do? I went and... and took the uh, shirt that, well, the three shirts that I had in my uh, larger bug out bag, you know, the different neutral earth colors, black and you know, brown, green, tried all three of them on, climbed into my bed, found out one of them would have had a collar where I would have had a lot of trouble sleeping or would have had to go shirtless with it or swap it out, extra time, extra noise. Yeah, good to know ahead of time. And that's one of those things where it's like, you might be able to get past, you might be able to take a knife and deal with it, but it's, it's just one more thing to chip away at your psychology if you're already sleeping out of your house, or outside your house, you're, you're somewhere unfamiliar, you don't feel safe, something's going on, you don't have all the information, but it's like midnight and you gotta sleep, you know? Yeah, good luck falling asleep like that. You don't need one more thing. So try sleeping in your clothes, uh, try sleeping in your jacket. Now, if you have some kind of metabolic thing or you're extremely old, extremely young, you have some kind of medical condition, sleep apnea... I don't know, some kind of something, what I just told you to try, or suggested that it might be an idea to try, that could be very dangerous for you. So like I said, you know, take everything I say with a grain of salt. I'm not saying absolutely go out and do this, you have to, your safety's on the line. I'm not trying to scare anybody into anything. If something sounds like something you don't want to do or shouldn't for your own safety or you're not sure, consult someone other than me. So different temperature, just try sitting at the computer, sitting around, walking around, active, lift stuff. You know, do you get too sweaty? The big thing is no matter what the temperature is outside, it's probably not a beautiful, perfect 70 Fahrenheit, you know, with perfect humidity. You're probably going to be sweating. You got the sunlight. You got all kinds of factors. And then at night, it's going to change anyway. So I probably don't need to tell you guys this. this. is super basic, but dress in layers for any kind of scenario if you can and bring layers. I mean, if you're splitting wood, walk around gathering stuff, dragging stuff, whatever, versus being as still as you possibly can trying to take out a squirrel to cook it and eat it or, you know, a rabbit or something. Those are two very different physical activity levels. And depending upon your physical activity level, you're going to need, you know, a thick jacket versus not. To be in very little clothing or some thicker clothing or two layers or one layer or none. If it's 90 out, I ain't wearing a shirt, just saying. So try walking around your house in your daily life in an average level of physical activity or kind of make it dynamic, like I said, if you want to try something, you know. And see if it's too hot, too cold, when do you have to stop, how much you sweat, you know, that kind of stuff. Just, just be aware of that. And also try it so that if you're like, oh man... I wish I was in my nice home and also the temperature. I don't know if I could sleep in this. I don't know if I could move in this. I don't know what this is going to be like. Am I dressed right? Well, one plan ahead and two, you'd think, oh yeah, I did that. I, I, I you know, turned the heat up, turned the, the uh, heat down, turned the cooling up, turned the cooling down. I've done that. I slept in it. I got around it. It didn't affect me that much. Or my gosh, am I an indoor person? My uh, metabolism is not the type that could just flip it really quickly. Uh, mine is, I think, because of what well, one genetics and two, where I grew up, the climate's all over the place. Oh, wait, that's not the climate, the weather, the weather is all over the place. And now like I, I thought it was pretty tough, but boy, I, I would put air conditioning and heating above like food in my budget right under internet. Cause I do not like being hot. I would always sweat. Turns out I actually have a medical condition involving hydration. So that's why I found sweating so uncomfortable and did it so abnormally but like I, i'd like to be exactly one temperature because i just grew up that way you know we had central air we had really good heating so i got used to being at exactly 70 when i was idle that's what i settled into and now with my new house you know after i moved out even my apartment was kind of all over the place but i could change it because it was a studio apartment i could change it to be what i was comfortable with very quickly so i got used to that year after year after year when i bought this house with how drafty and old it is and just all over the place insulation wise and stuff Oh boy, I got used to temperature swings, and that furnace is made for a house about 10 times the size, I'm convinced, that that thing can heat it up 10 degrees in like three minutes. And it does. You turn it on, it just goes. So I'm used to it. So I, I tried it. I tried sleeping in like 61 degrees, which is not that much of a swing from normal, and uh, yeah, I just 
you know, under the blankets, I just kind of adjusted. I was fine. Or if my arms were cold, my head was cold, I just kind of put a little something extra on and that adapted. And I would have thought, oh, I got to put on a sweater. This is, you know, this is so cold. No, sleeping, it wasn't. Under the blankets, it was pretty stable. And then just sitting around, kind of typing on the computer, doing my normal work. I, my fingers were so cold. I'm like, I can't even type in gloves. I got to do something about this. And I kept having to jump up and do like uh, jumping jacks like every 5, 10, 20 minutes just to heat up. So apparently I wasn't very good at like idle heat generation which is shocking because i thought i was but until you try it you don't know so if you feel more in control and you keep telling yourself factually so not lying to yourself because being delusional doesn't help anything but telling yourself in a scenario i'm not in control of the temperature but i've done this before i know what to do about it i know what to take off what you know what i could sleep in that it's like one less thing where you could be like at least i'm confident about this and you can kind of check it off your list if you're like, well, th that was nothing. Yeah, a couple degrees, really, you should be able to handle it. But are you sure? Now, another thing, this is more of a skill check. You know, this isn't all just like psychological, ooh, I'm prepared, I'm, I'm tough enough for this, Let, let's ramp it up, you know? Some of this is more, do I know how to do this? Like, I, I think this would be easy, but I'm going to try it. So I wanted to throw this one because it's a little bit different. Uh, bathing, but not in a full shower. Sorry, everybody, I'm deeply offending by, you know, if you live in a second world country or worse. I don't know how you're watching this, but hey, you know, it's 2023. You might be. But um, yeah, if you're used to a shower every day or once in a while, you skip one and just whatever. You're not that bad. I don't know if you're like me and you're a guy. <laughs> Maybe not. Nothing fine about me skipping one. Trust me. Holy cow. And, and because of like the sun and giant influx when you're used to washing every single day, the amount of, like, weird additional bacteria, smells, oils, fungal issues from being wet or dry or skin irritation, itching. I just, the, the weirdness that can come before you kind of just settle in. Like people used to do before internal plumbing or when they're, you know, when they're away at a camp or a welding project or a logging thing or just whatever. They would find, yeah, you can kind of settle in and just kind of stabilize the way that, like, humans were meant to be. But also we were meant to not wear clothes. Not that I'm, you know promoting that in any way those people are weirdos but the, most of north america we weren't even meant to survive in those temperatures so if we're gonna go that far you know let me throw that one out there that and this many years later we're not designed to survive in almost anything we are terrible as far as like the animal kingdom and surviving you put us out with with you know little to no clothes and a, and a knife we're, we're gonna get some temperature issues we're gonna get some bug issues the lack of hair alone and then you got sunburns okay don't even get me started but bathing, there's a reason most animals do that. There's a reason that people held bathing in high regards almost in any part of history. And anything you hear differently is like some little one-off little, you know, religious sect cult thing. Or just like a complete and utter misconception of how people lived in medieval times. You basically have to bathe daily no matter what your situation is. So you better have some water in a bucket or live near a stream or be able to do something. And not everybody had soap and all that. So like, cool, I got some you know, biodegradable camp soap and a bar of soap in my emergency go bag. But what you need to do is, is because I had to do this. This actually took me by surprise. This is half the reason I'm making this series. My shower was down with a plumbing issue for a couple days. I thought, I'm not going to not shower. Then I thought, okay, people shower without a shower all the time. You just need water and a washcloth and some soap. I got dangerously cold very quick because I had to do it in my basement where like the faucet with an open sink was. That thing was sketchy. There wasn't enough room, but like, okay, that. That's a little specific, but um, I found it really hard to rinse. I got water everywhere. Then I'm like, well, now there's water in the basement. I kind of need to clean that up because it's a slip hazard and a temperature and humidity thing. So the whole like not getting soap on the ground. No, if you're outside, that's fine. But it's harder than you think to take what, you know, I guess I could just call a homeless person sink bath or uh, my shower just broke bath. And see, now that I say that, you're probably thinking, oh, if like, you know, crackheads and mentally deranged, you know, homeless people can figure it out and they, they power through it, they find a way to do it, so can I. Yeah, well, they're numbing their feelings with something usually, first of all. But secondly, I'm no high society guy. I go out in the woods. I'm tough. I'm used to stuff. I've been through some stuff. I thought, how hard could it be to take a sink bath for two or three days? It turns out immensely harder than I thought. Let's just say by day three, I just went to my parents' house. It was cold, highly uncomfortable, took way longer than I thought, was way harder than I thought. Not spilling everything on everything was huge. It was difficult to just take like a pail of water even and just bath it out. Now, if I was outside, it would be fine, but I didn't have a place to do that. Come to think of it, I probably should have just, oh no, that has, it has windows. Good Lord, my neighbors hate me enough. But uh, could have hit the garage. If you're out in the woods, total free for all. It's still complicated, but you could go a lot faster without having to worry about what drips what. But see, I wouldn't have known that. So if I just think now, okay, I've taken a sink bath. I know what's what's uh, what's involved. 
I learned quite a bit that I didn't even suspect about what to do and not to do, and I was pretty clean at the end of it. I was very acceptable to go into work the next day. So I've been through it. I know how to do it. It's a skill check, and there you go. So try taking an improvised uh, cleaning routine for a day and just, you know, just, just to experience it, just to see how it goes, you know, and be prepared for it psychologically. And I'm, I'm stressing this because uh, you guys ever heard of emetophobia? I think that's what it is. It's the fear of throwing up, and a lot of people have it. If the last time they threw up, it's like when they were a kid or something, or just never. So the memories aren't really there, and you're like, oh, man, that looks so horrible. That That's unnatural. It scares me. I'm frightened of the unknown. I don't like, you know, my body doing things I'm not in full control of that are, like, automatic. Well, what's the number one cure for emetophobia, which is actually really widespread? I had to admit myself. And then I got really bad food poisoning. I mean really bad, because I have a bit of an iron stomach. The best agreed-upon cure for emetophobia is throwing up once. And I'm not saying go do it to cure your emetophobia. Do not do that. But yeah, you get sick enough, or if you're an idiot, get drunk enough, which I do not support at all. I think alcohol should be illegal, but that's a topic for another video. Everybody who goes through it is like, well, that's not that bad, unless you're like throwing up blood or something for a car accident. Then afterwards, you're like, oh, why did I fear this for like over a decade? I was slightly unpleasant for a couple seconds. Once you've done something once, you are so much more mentally prepared to go through it a second time because it's not even like, oh, I don't know if I could really build a fire really out in the woods because I live, you know, in an apartment and I'd never practiced it, but I watched five YouTube videos on how to do it and get the gist of it. I think I'm pretty good, but once you're there doing it, you're like, oh, can I really do this? Well, if you've done it once, you know, whether it's a, a skill, knowledge, you know, proficiency thing or a, can I get through this? Is this going to be awful? Can I tolerate this? Like a pure psychological circumstance thing. Both of them can be solved by, well, I've done it once before. It's actually, it's kind of the same concept as exposure therapy. Very controversial. I'm a big fan of it because it worked for me, but I, you know, to each their own. But if you have some like big fear of, I don't know, I don't know, something, and then you go do it. Like some people get over their fear heights the second they get a job working on something with ladders. After you go up, you look down, your heart's pounding, and then nothing happens, and then you're scared of it, nothing happens, you're scared of it, nothing happens, you're scared of it, nothing happens. It is a very deep, basic psychological thing for your brain to switch it off and just say, okay, I'm, I'm wrong about this. No matter how much evidence I have that this is dangerous, I just, n nothing, I, I keep freaking out over nothing. That's calories, that's, you know, stress hormones, that's a disruption in my day, that's uh, unnecessary actions that interfere with eating, sleeping, and everything else you need to do to stay alive. So eventually it says, okay, I'm going to stop being scared of this. I mean, people who train lions, people who do dangerous jobs. Now it does have its limits. You ask anybody on the SWAT team if they ever stop being afraid. I mean, they, they learn to switch it off and they work through it other ways, but there's certain things where your higher brain will be like, no, that is actually dangerous. Trust me. I, I was legitimate in that. So if you're asking yourself, can I really d do this? And you've done it three times before, you've already got it started on the, the, the like exposure therapy effect. I'm sure there's some term for it. And that's why this works. And like I said, it, it, as soon as you're sitting there thinking about, all the things like this situation how am i going to get out of this rethinking going through your mind over and over and over that's another thing if you're in a bad scenario your brain's going to keep popping it up you want to try and distract yourself it better be good because if you're sitting there alone with your own thoughts and your thoughts are you know is my family's my friends okay my finances okay what's going on i've got no communication what about wild animals? It's because real threats in a stressful environment are going to keep popping into your head so that you think about them, process them, and survive through it by planning ahead. Your brain really likes to do that, and it's all to keep you alive. And now once you understand that, you also won't feel like, whoa, my psychology is spiraling out of control. I'm not as tough as I thought. Ah, No, now you'll think back to this video and think, oh, I know what's happening. That makes sense. If that sounds familiar, I did give it out as some like PTSD general advice. Where it's not, oh, I was in, you know, gunfire, I was in a war zone, now I came home and fireworks, you know, trigger me. Oh, I'm so out of control, this is, I can't handle, you know, my body's doing this and I, I don't, you know, I don't understand what's happening. I'm not out of control, this worries me, and you start spiraling, you get worse and worse and worse. You get worried that you're worried about something that you're worried about. And it just keeps going, layers, layers, piling on until people can't handle it and bad things start happening. But if you sit back and think, oh, yeah, it sounds like gunshots and my brain is like, well, the last time I was being shot at, so I was in a threatening, dangerous situation, now something similar came up and my body is telling me fight or flight, like hardcore telling me to get out of here adrenaline shaking as long as you're like oh but it's it's trying to keep me alive it's a natural thing i understand why it's happening it's not going to stop it from happening but you're you're going to be able to like at a higher level override it a lot better and just ride through it and be like oh this is happening because of this i get it i understand it okay i am in control to an extent and i don't need to spiral out of control about is this going to go away is this going to be worse why is this happening so this turned into like the psychology video but i still wanted to reiterate and explain after the three examples 
why this is a thing and why we're doing it. And if you appreciate that, leave a thumbs up on the video, but I'm going to throw a couple more at you. I know, you hate it when the teacher gives out homework, but, you know, hopefully at this point, I'm joking. And you see that, and you're like, I should try this. I should try a little, like, mini dry run of a little, like, hardship or a little hard scenario or a little a, a thing, you know? Another one, just navigating with a map. You don't even need to actually leave your house, or certainly don't pull up a paper map while you're driving, my gosh. But, you know, get the highlighter, get a pen, make some marks, get a pencil, whatever, you get a map. Well, not even a real map necessary. You can do it on the screen, technically. Take a screenshot. Paper is a little more realistic. It's more of like a dry run of, oh, man, I'm out in the woods without my cell phone because it died. Although out in the woods, I mean, we're, I'm talking like a road map. Just plan a trip saying, hey, we got to get, you know, north. Just pick a direction. Oh, there's a wildfire. There's aliens. There's zombies. There's radioactive spill. A train blew up. One of those happened not too far away from me. I'll let you guess which one. That's way more fun. I mean, get out some dice and roll them if you want. They're a random direction or just, you know, whatever. Okay, we got to go east because we got to go east. That's where we're leaving. Also, all the electronics don't work. I don't know what kind of scenario that is, but I guess if the tower is down, it doesn't matter if your phone turns on. It won't really do anything. Oh my gosh, download an offline maps program. And depending on the scenario, GPS should still work. But sometimes you might have to use paper. So just plan a route, you know, mark how to do it, look what landmarks you would look for, intersections, maybe even go actually drive it, ride it with your bike, whatever. I mean, bare minimum, just open a map, look at the different symbols, figure it out, figure out what the scale means, kind of compare it in your head to distances you know about with driving and stuff and say, oh yeah, okay, this is the speed, this is about this many minutes, we'll have to take a right, here's an option in case this is blocked, it, like, and if it's a weather event, it probably is, that happens all the time near me. Every time there's a windstorm or a tornado, we get branches down, and one of them happened right after I moved, I had to find a very creative path back to my uh, apartment. Very late at night in the dark, and I almost ran straight into power line. Luckily, the tree was in front of it, the tree branch, otherwise it was black. I might have missed it. That would have been bad. But guess what else didn't work at that point? My phone! Because the tower was down, because, I don't know, the tower was down. Maybe it tipped over. <laughs> I have no idea. It was a tornado. Generate ran out of fuel? Doesn't have a generator as a UPS? I don't know. Whatever it was, I had no data, no signal, nothing. So I had to know my neighborhood, which that's another thing. Walk around your neighborhood, know the exits, know the streets, know everything. If you always drive out one way, drive out the other three ways that are possible just to see them. And, and you know, maybe even walk it so you can stop and say, oh, yeah, or at least if you're in a car, pull over. And then you think, hey, you know, this landmark, this, this is not wide enough. This is a weird turn. This is always busy. People like to take this route. They don't take this one. This is why. Um, this is a roundabout way to get there, but I almost maybe should take this the first way and then mix that with kind of the paper map and, you know, it's kind of learn your area, which you should do anyway. That's just like knowledge and skills and practice and that's not really the scope of this video. But the skill of using a map and planning a route on paper with no technology assistance, I think you should do that. I've had people where they buy a map, never crack it open, never look at it, or they just look at it for three seconds, oh, that's neat, cool, I'll use it when I use it. And then it's like stressful situation. You got to get out. There's a thing coming. There's a threat. There's a whatever. You get, you're, you're getting out ahead of people because you're smart. And you want to get on the roads before the, oh, and the stressful situation. Did I bring everything? Did I remember something? Oh, what about my computer? What, what, should I bring that? Okay, the car's full. Should I bring gas? Should we stop for gas? Oh, and now the phone's not working. Now we got to use a map. On oh, I got to learn to use a map. I should have done that ahead of time. See, now take that one thing after another stressful situation where everything's panicking. Or at least you're trying to not panic, trying to stay calm. Frantic, stressful situation regardless. And add on top of it one more thing where now you don't know where you're going and you got to figure out how to read a map. And like which way is north and this and that. It like just do the basics with like, I wouldn't even call it orienteering, just map reading. And then when you get to that point, you're like, okay, at least I know how to read the map. I kind of know my local area. And if I don't, I can, I can find where I am on the map. I know this is north and the sun's here. And okay, we got to go this way. Take a right, take a left, mark it. Draw directly on the map, reference it, hand it to somebody, train them to, you know. Now you're like, okay, now at least this is the easy part. You don't need one more hard thing that costs you more time, especially. So that's about it for the ideas for this one. I went to the, like, really easy ones. I think maybe these will get harder as they go, but if you have a suggestion, I would love to hear it for future videos down in the comments section. And I'll give you one example of something you really shouldn't do. Um, I think I outlined this in the other video, but it's worth repeating because different people watch different videos according to my stats. Which I also look at and study closely because, one, I'm not new to YouTube, if you're familiar with my other channel, duh. But because I care. I want to make content that people that actually helps people and that people actually want to watch because it's mutually beneficial and it's the right moral thing to do. So if you appreciate that, once again, subscribe, watch my other content. But uh, 
One thing I'm going to mention that you shouldn't do is, well, you really should just go hands-on and find out how hard it is and what the process really is instead of a theoretical working knowledge of changing a tire. Well, taking a tire off and putting it back on, you got to retorque it at about 50 miles, but is that highway or is that city? And then, oh, now you need a torque wrench. And then what about this? What if you do it wrong and you shear this off? Then you got to get a tow. You got to get a stud pushed back in. And then they don't have the parts. They don't have a press. You should not take off your tires ever unless you've got a darn good reason or if the car is extremely new. And even then, you can throw off the balance. You can throw off the alignment a tiny little bit, usually not too nuts. And uh, personally, I've done less damage to my car doing a tire rotation than the last place I brought it to who cross-threaded one of my nuts. And then I had to press in my own uh, stud and borrow a car for a couple hours. Oh, I was real happy about that. But yeah, taking off your tires, it, like in the movies and just in general lore shockingly enough it's it's wrong it's not the easiest thing in the world to do and even if it is easy and you're strong capable and you got good tools and all that and it makes it easy it's inherently dangerous to your car you should not take a a, a, a tire off unless you have a darn good reason and doing it just to do it when you just have the knowledge of how to do it is not a good enough reason you would be putting your own safety at risk by doing something wrong or the long-term wear to the threads and the, the re, like how the metals work together, it's all the stuff you don't know about unless you know about. And so you could be causing more problems to yourself and your vehicle, which could be very expensive and disruptive and stressful and expensive. Yeah, I'll put expensive on the list twice. If you screw something up, so you should absolutely not do that. I've heard other YouTubers tell you to go out and do it. They're clearly not auto mechanics. Neither am I, but I watched some auto tech stuff on YouTube. And they told me, don't take off your tires without a good reason. Here's why. And I verified it. It's true what they're saying. So that's something you shouldn't do. I mean, that's right up there with, I'm going to test my water filter ahead of time because I'd rather get sick before the collapse than after. So I'm going to take lake water and drink it through my, my life straw. That is not worth the risk. If you've got a defective one, yeah, you're going to have a bad time. But, uh... Boy, is that dangerous to do now. The odds that you'd be out of water, any drinkable, anything out in the middle of somewhere sometime is pretty low. And then you already opened your filter and unsealed it. So, like, there, there's a lot wrong with that. So I could make a whole other video about what not to do. But one thing you should do is subscribe to hear more from this series. Like I said, recommendations, welcome in the comments section or any other comments. I read them all. And if your comment gets hidden or delayed, it's because for security reasons, safety, and civility, the three S's. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, all comments are held for review, and I usually review them once every day tops. So no, you're not shadow banded. YouTube isn't necessarily in this specific case out to get you. So thanks for watching, everybody. Go do your homework assignments, and I'll see you guys next time.